Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is definitely a novelty, what we're doing here. So welcome to the first of the uh, Leica Academy webinars. Um, bear with us. This is all very new. So I'm rather hoping everything goes smoothly. There's all this technology hooked up. And I'm hoping everybody can hear me. All my little meters are going at the right levels and so on. So uh, if there's anybody who has any problems, you can use the chat or the Q&A to get some help from our assistants. Um, and somebody just popped up on my screen saying, yes, I can hear you. So that's great. All right. So um, this is the first one of our webinars. As I said, we have got some ideas for future ones. Um, for instance, next uh, Friday, at the same time, we're going to do another one uh, on essence of landscapes. And then after that, we have other ideas which may uh, change as we get feedback, because what I would love to get you guys to do is to suggest topics that you would like to be discussed or topics that I can do as uh, standalone videos uh, rather than actually um, webinars, because obviously webinars are live uh, at a certain time of the day, um, whereas the standalone videos we can record and have on the website. So any ideas like that would be great. Um, now, the chat is just an informal thing that you'll see, but what we'd like you to do is if you have a question, uh, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, because those questions get logged and they're being monitored as we speak um, by highly trained individuals in the background. And um, at the end of my presentation, uh, we will go to those questions and uh, it's quite possible that there will be uh, many people asking the same question um, and so on. So we'll go through as many as we can. I hope that my little presentation this afternoon will take about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have 20 minutes or so for, uh, for um, the questions. And um, so I think we should, uh, we should press on. Why don't we do that? Here we go. Now, uh, those of you who know me, and I see a lot of familiar friends, uh, familiar friends, yeah, familiar faces and friends on my, uh, my list of attendees, which is up to 131 now. So we've got a lot of people there, and you can see me down in the bottom right-hand corner there. Um, those of you who, uh, who know what I do and have been following me will know I've just been to Antarctica, which of course has caused a few problems, as I'm sure you are all terribly aware of at the moment. Um, we were very lucky. We were stuck on a ship for a while. Uh, we got back about a week late. It wasn't, um, it wasn't the worst thing. Uh, we had a few tensions on board because we didn't know whether we were going to get home or not, but we managed to get home. We've uh, been in quarantine for two weeks. And rather than dwell on that, um, I think we should be looking forward and we will all be back traveling in the future. And so I thought I'd just share some images from the, the shoot that I did in Antarctica and go through the thought processes and the little bit of the techniques behind the pictures, just to show you what I, uh, I work on, what I think about, and also uh, what the pictures are aimed at, because uh, I think one of the most important things that um, you need to have when you're photographing is a direction. So these pictures are taken for a purpose, and I'll go through those uh, purposes as we go through. So I'll start with this one. This is uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, one of the South Shetland Islands. And the point here uh, is, is just drama drama of light if you can get an image with drama of light in it then you are already way ahead of the pack it's it's all about that impact and about the, uh, nature at its finest and so on and this this was just high winds blowing um uh, it's not a catabatic cloud i don't know what it is exactly but it's a cloud forming over the top of that mountain and the light was just catching it so it's only a moment so you just need to be ready to actually capture these things um now I'd also just see a message here that my audio is a little bit out of sync. Mm, please bear with me on this one. We did adjust this a while ago. Um, it's uh, the internet connection can vary. Hopefully it won't be too much of a problem. Um, anyway, I, I will press on. Then there's this concept of simplicity which I'd always, those of you who've been to my lectures will know I'm often banging on about simplifying your picture down to the absolute bare essence. Um, this is a uh, penguin. It's an, not an Adelie, it'll be a Gentoo penguin. And one of the things I've done here is I've simply isolated it as much as I possibly can. Um, it sounds like a simple, obvious thing to those of you who are more experienced, but to the beginner, this is actually one of the most powerful things you can do to improve your photographs, is to be simple and bold and fill the frame. Now, 
in, uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula, you're not really allowed to go more than, uh, sorry, less than about five meters from the wildlife. So you do need to use a telephoto lens. And this is taken on the Leica CL using the 90 to 280 lens which is uh, a beautiful combination. It might not be obvious because, and I'll hold it up after I finish talking, I've got one next to me. Uh, it's a little bit uh, of a strange looking combination. There's a very small camera sitting on a very large lens, but boy, does it work well. The autofocus absolutely nails it. And it gives you that extra reach because it's an APS-C size sensor on a full frame lens. So it becomes something around about a 400 mil lens, which is perfect for this sort of shot. Same with this. Now that telephoto pull also gives you the impression of this foreshortening effect. Um, and, and photographing the penguin from straight on gives you this lovely sort of ball of feathers with this little head and a beak poking out the front is all um, fluffed up against the cold. But also notice the viewpoint. This is not a looking down shot. A lot of people, especially when I'm, you know, I was with other people on this trip, and a lot of people will take their pictures from just a standing position. It's comfortable, it's easy. But this sort of shot would not work if you were actually looking down on the penguin. So I'm lying down on the ground in front of it, five meters away, of course, and that gives me that wonderful foreshortened perspective with his, the color of his beak and his eyes right in the middle of the round shape of his body. This actually isn't my photograph, but it was one that we shot collectively because I work with my wife quite a bit and she shoots lots of pictures when I'm not on, uh, not, not in a certain place. Like uh, I was already on shore at this point uh, and she shot this picture from the, the deck of the ship as a Zodiac headed off into the icebergs. The reason I've included this one, and if I can just get my mouse onto the screen, hopefully you can see that, is these two very, very strong diagonals here which take your eye to where the Zodiac is going, which is over here somewhere. So you've got this almost like a story taking your eye across here. Now you can't obviously contrive these things because the photograph, I mean, the, the scene is what it is, but when you recognize it, it's a great thing to work with. And the Zodiac is in exactly the right position, too far to the right, it would be sort of the moments past, too far to the left and it's tucked away in the left-hand corner too much. So there's a moment where everything comes together and you could almost say that's Henri Cartier Bresson's decisive moment. But and you don't get to control this stuff. And this is actually another important point. Um, I'm a documentary photographer, but I shoot what I call commercial documentary. Um, it's basically shooting documentary style images, but in a, for a commercial purpose. And in this particular case, that would be uh, advertising and brochure images for the cruise ship company Ponant um, on whose ship we were sailing. This is the sort of image that you could imagine being used as a double page spread uh, with text maybe overlaid on it. Um, and one of the things I'm always trying to do is leave room for something like that. So the thing is, this is a useful picture. And lots of the pictures that I shoot, I'm trying to be a create a good photograph, but also B, create a useful photograph. And that's not always exactly the same thing. Also, we like to show pictures of the ship in situ. Um, the ship obviously is a very attractive thing in its own right, but we don't want to show the ship on its own directly because we know what the ship looks like. It's in all the other brochure pictures. What we want to show is where the ship is. And, and that's this sort of image uh, gives it context and, and location. But what I want to draw your attention to here, and the reason I picked this picture, is there are penguins through here, but they don't stand out against the rocks except for these two here. And that's what makes the picture. I've got other images very similar where there's no penguins here and you really can't see them. So the penguins give it context um, and also they show that there is wildlife to be seen. Um, because one of the things that we want to show is that if you come on a cruise like this, you will see certain sorts of wildlife. So we want to show the wildlife with the ship, with other guests, with zodiacs and so on. And that's a little bit tricky. Again, the ship's actually over here, very small. We're just showing that we really did go to this place. It's not a particular, it's not a place that is uh, completely inaccessible. This is where we go. Um, the, uh, my... My mantra, if you like, with these sorts, this sort of work is this could be you. So if you are coming on a trip like this, this is the sort of image that you will get. And the proof of that is by really including the ship or other guests, in, but in subtle ways. So as not to destroy the picture or to spoil it in some way. I don't want to be overtly commercial. I just want to be subtly commercial. 
Now, you'll also notice between this shot and the previous shot, the water looks very different. This is shot with a long lens. This is shot with a super wide lens. And if I remember, remember, them, remember correctly, this is the 11 to 23 mil on the CL, uh, which I was using as my super wide. And that's why the water looks so much more glossy and more transparent is because at the bottom of the frame, you're really looking almost vertically down into the water. Whereas in the previous shot, you're looking at an oblique angle to it and it looks more gray and less translucent. So if you want to get really glossy, shiny water and, and, and see through it to the blue of that iceberg in this case, then a super wide and super wide angle lens used close will give you that result. Then of course, I'm looking for patterns, abstracts, um, what sort of uh, images that might be used for graphical elements on a page, not necessarily a particular place, but just more of a mood or a shape, or in this case, the color of the ice. Um, these are the little details that the telephoto lens allows you to pick out. And um, on the subject of lenses, I used uh, probably 90% of the shots were taken on either the 90 to 280 on the CL or this SL2, or the good standby lens, the 24 to 90, which is my go-to lens for so many things. So there's very little you can't do with that lens. It's astonishingly useful. Then you can have some fun, look for some abstract shapes. Um, one of the uh, old um, okay, myths, if you like, of uh, for beginning in photography is you should have the sun behind you at all times. This is okay if you don't want to worry about getting a bad exposure because it's much easier when the light's behind you. But the best pictures, in my estimation, are, are when the sun is actually in front of you. And you'll see a lot of my work uh, involves contrajour lighting, which is basically looking into the sun. And the reason this picture has these two strong lines is because the sun is actually behind these ridges and all it's illuminating is just that little edge. So it gives it that very strong Z shape. Um, without that, it would just be overlapping white and you wouldn't have any sense of depth. So shooting into the light is really use is a really powerful technique. And it's one of the reasons I use the, the Leica lenses because they are particularly good at the sun or the light coming into the lens in a hard way, very contrasty, and it maintains shadow detail really well. So they're, they're designed for this sort of photograph. I, I just threw this in for a bit of a joke. It's another penguin, it's just an iceberg, but you sometimes see the most astonishing shapes. Um, and this was one that somebody pointed out to me. I was too busy looking at the penguins uh, surrounding me um, to notice this. And someone said, oh, look, there's a big penguin over there. And I thought they were serious for a moment, but uh, they, they, uh, they pointed this, this iceberg out and I thought, well, I might as well capture it. Why not? Now, Working for uh, an expedition cruise ship, they want to show the wildlife that we are likely to see. Now, if I show pictures of, or if they publish pictures of the wildlife on its, on their, on its own, just in isolation, you don't know whether that was the sort of thing you are likely to see or not. But if people like me can capture images of the wildlife and the ship, or other guests in the same shot, well, that adds a whole different dynamic because that's kind of proof that the sorts of wildlife we expect to see, actually we do see. You might not see it on your particular cruise, but certainly um, you know, you've got a very strong chance. So it's almost like proving the point. This was us coming back um, from a Zodiac cruise, and this is a crab eater seal sitting on an ice floe. I think we only saw two the entire cruise, and there was one right next to us. So I was able to get the Zodiac driver to uh, slow down and uh, as we moved past because uh, he wasn't able to stop we were on a schedule um, and I couldn't certainly couldn't control him because we were with other guests and I'm not allowed to interrupt their enjoyment of everything so as as it came past I had to shoot this very quickly and this leads me to another important point is that um, you need to be able to shoot without really having to think too much about your exposure and your focusing it needs to be second nature and by that I mean you need to master the camera the the operation of the camera is only is something that you can learn without even going out of the house and hey there's an idea you could do this right now because nobody's going out very much so learning how to operate that camera get a sharp well exposed picture as a second nature thing is incredibly useful because when things are changing and something unique has cropped up, you really don't want to be fumbling around with the controls. You should be able to change your aperture and your shutter speed and nail that focus pretty much without having to think too much about it. 
So this is something you can practice at home. It's not about taking a good photograph. It's simply about taking a technically successful picture, which means sharp and well exposed. You can practice on the cat, the dog, photograph your foot, at the, whatever you want to do. But just learn. And the muscle memory is what you need. It's practice, practice, practice. These sorts of shots I can nail every time because I've been doing this for almost 40 years. That's the muscle memory. And there's no reason that anybody else couldn't do the same thing as long as you've got that ability to shoot quickly and get a successful picture. Now, um, Jay Maysell, as a photographer from New York from uh, the 80s and 90s, he's still around, I believe, uh, he's a very influential photographer. He had this expression that um, every photograph should have a gesture. Now, that doesn't mean this gesture, as in a, a finger pointing or something like this, although it obviously counts, and that's why I've included it, but something that just lifts the picture above the ordinary. It can be an expression, it can be a position, it can be a juxtaposition of something, a glint of light, but some little thing that lifts it above the ordinary. And in this particular case, it was this is a skewer, uh, yeah, there's a skewer mobbing uh, this zodiac full of, um, full of guests. And the lady at the front just, was drawing uh, the attention of the guest to the bird as it hovers above her and she just pointed in a, the blink of an eye she pointed and brought her hand right back down again again this is why you've got to have that camera handy and uh, the ability to focus and get the shot framed and exposed without thinking too much now if i was with a live audience i would ask a question as what's wrong with this picture but i'm going to answer the question for you i would prefer that her hand did not uh, was not outlined against that dark bit of background. It's just a small thing. If it was against the white, it would be a slightly stronger picture. But hey, it's what happened. It's what I caught, and I'm quite happy with it. Here we go. This is the guest and critter picture, as I call it. This is me trying to get a sense of the guest's experience, also without showing faces. So not difficult at all. What they really want me to do, and this is in my brief, is they want a picture of a zodiac with uh, red jacketed guests, all looking at some wildlife with the yellow jacketed guy pointing or talking or something. And in, it's really hard to get because obviously animals don't cooperate and whales come up randomly around you. This is in, uh, ooh, what was the name of the bay? Uh, can't remember off the top of my head. I'm sure Janelle, who I know is on chat, might remember that one. Um, but these were humpback whales. Um, because the minke whales don't lift their tails up, apparently. So this was a humpback. And what I wanted was the, the classic guests looking at the tail disappearing down into the water. And we got just one or two frames like this with the perfect whale tail sticking up. Um, when I did this talk on board the ship, because I have done this talk once before, one of the guests said, there is a problem with this picture. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, that's because one of the guests is standing up and you're not normally allowed to stand up in the Zodiacs. But you can if you ask the, the, the driver. So I'm going to say that's what that must have been what happened. So it's a picture they'll find very useful. Then um, there we go. Janelle says Wilhelmina Bay. Thank you very much, Janelle, for reminding me what the name of that bay was. Then you've got the tiny details, or in this case, not so tiny, but the close-up details. This is just a, uh, an iceberg that was floating past that I happened to be going close to. And as we came around the side of it, I saw the light was shining through this amazing textured shape. Um, so again, this is a sort of picture I would always see as a useful graphic element in a design, because I'm always thinking in terms of publication and graphic layouts on pages. I'm thinking a little bit less in terms of one standalone image that you could hang on your wall. At the back of my mind, I'm probably thinking like that, but my fundamental motivation here is to come up with a set of pictures, a story that captures the whole essence of the place. Same with this one, it's the same iceberg actually. Um, just saw an interesting shape. And more importantly, like the first photograph I showed you of the mountain with the wind and the, uh, the, the beautiful light on the peak, this is all about the light. The color's interesting, but this looks like a frozen wave and the, the light was shining through the iceberg in such, that, uh, such a way that it highlighted it like this. And again, just a grab shot as we came past, you've got to be able to nail that shot, get the exposure right quickly. This is actually another one of Janelle's pictures. I was on shore already. She was on the back of the ship. And as the Zodiacs leave, she's come up with this lovely dawn picture. And this is a sort of image you could imagine 
um, being used again in the brochure. Lots and lots of space for text. So you could have details about the trip or, or whatever you want to do. And behind it is a, as an evocative picture of the sorts of places you're going to be visiting, but still a strong image. So uh, in that sense, it's a very successful picture. You, you could argue it's not one you're going to hang on your wall. Well, that's fine. I don't mind. It fits in the brief perfectly. That's why I've included this picture. Now, here's a, a slightly more technically difficult picture. All of the pictures we've seen so far have been handheld. Um, I always take a tripod with me. I very rarely end up using it because lots of these pictures are taken um, off on the hoof, as it were, spontaneously as things happen. Because remember, you've got no control. Um, I have very limited opportunity to stage anything. Um, in fact, I'm probably not even allowed to because I'm not really supposed to interfere with what the guests are doing. I have to capture things as they happen. But every now and again, you've got some time. And this is, um, you, this is me using one of my very uh, rarely used but very important photographic accessories, which is my 10-stop neutral density filter. Um, that's why the water is blurred, because this is something around the 60-second mark as an exposure in the early morning. So I was able to go on shore a little bit earlier and do these sorts of pictures before the guests arrived. And I found this uh, sort of sea of um, icebergs, a bit like in um, Iceland, I suppose, at Jokulks Island Beach. Um, and I was able to capture a 60 second exposure, which lets the water blur. It's not a, an accessory I use very much, but it always lives in my camera bag. And every now and again, I'll pull it out and get a shot that's just that little bit different. We were also very lucky that when we sailed away from the peninsula heading for South Georgia, which is coming up next, we went past um, the second largest iceberg that's ever been seen by human beings, an iceberg called A68, um, which was about the size of Fraser Island, somewhere around 160 kilometers long, I believe. And also surrounding it were large other um, tabular icebergs like these and these are the sort of the classic icebergs that you expect to see. We also were astonishingly lucky with the weather and we had a couple of very clear low wind days and if anybody who's listening has been to Antarctica you'll know that this is by no means the norm. Obviously they're the pictures you often see because they're the best looking pictures but a lot of the times it's grey and murky but we had this amazing cruise I and mean, we're sailing in a in a 150 meter ship it's not that big but it's still big enough and we're going through gaps in these icebergs which are no more than two or three hundred meters across. The, uh, the, the, the helmsman and the captain did an astonishing job, quite beautiful. This is an easy picture to shoot. It, we, we, I shot a lot of pictures of these uh, as you can imagine as we went through the, um, all these, these tabular icebergs. Why not convert it to black and white? I, I have a, 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 an ongoing dis disagreement with my business manager that's Janelle, um, about the value of black and white. Personally, I love black and white, but she correctly tells me it's not very commercially valuable. Most, I say most, all of my images uh, that get published are in colour, with the occasional exception of an article I might write for uh, the magazine, like Australian Photography, which is specifically about black and white photography. But on a personal level, I really like the way black and white pulls out um, the, the, the textures. The colour of this previous image is really not that important. We can infer that it's a blue sky because of the shapes of the clouds, but let's just drill back down into the shapes and the textures and add some contrast. And I think this is a stronger image. Again, that's just my opinion. It's my photograph, I'm allowed an opinion. You may disagree, maybe we could talk about it later. We even had a sea fog. Um, which is, I was got very excited about because uh, those of you who know me will know that when it gets foggy and the sun's out, I, there's always, I'm always going, look, this is great. It could be awful or it could be amazing. And in this particular case, surprisingly, it wasn't as good as, as, as I was expecting. I like this picture. I've put it in just as an example of something different. But to be honest, I find it a little bit flat. Um, you can see on the left hand side, there's another tabular iceberg here. And without that, you've got no sense of depth whatsoever. But um, for me, I was expecting a bit more and I did my best and it, it works. It, it's a picture we might be able to use. Here's the gesture. Now, this is now uh, after two or three days sailing 
we came to South Georgia Island, which is uh, an amazing part of the world. I, in some respects, I found it more impressive than uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, but we, it was at my first trip. I had nothing to compare it with, and uh, they were both just astonishing, interesting places. These are king penguins, not uh, emperor penguins, are the big ones that you only see in the, in the, the center of Antarctica. Um, they're the ones that are about a meter and a half high. These are king penguins, which are very similar, and they have this most astonishing feather arrangement and these yellow stripes on the bottom and side of their necks and on the bottom of their beaks. They're the smartest looking birds I've ever seen. Now here's that gesture I was talking about. This is just a moment. Uh, and I've shot a sequence here. I don't use a motor drive like shooting a bang, 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 bang. I'm trying to time my shots. But again, using that long lens, the 90 to 280 on the CL, and I'm waiting for a moment where there's a really interesting shape. Again, mastery of the camera, focused, exposed, and then waiting for the moment where something interesting happens. And in this case, I just love the shapes, the way that the right-hand penguin is balancing on one foot, scratching her head whilst the male penguin, I, I'm guessing which is male and which is female here, by the way, is almost like holding her and saying, you know, just, just balancing it. There you go. You know, that's it. Well done. So that's that gesture picture. And then there's the cute picture. But remember what I said about the penguin right at the beginning, the simplification? This is isolating the subject in nice light, overcast this particular day, but with a background which is completely non-distracting. Um, again, this is on the 90 to 280 on the SL, and I need to make some prints of this shot because it is so astonishingly crisp, 47 megapixels. Um, it would make a print, you know, a meter and a half, two meters wide, just no problem at all, and beautiful tonality. So this was showing up the ability of the equipment to capture high quality images and also perform at a high level because this uh, little little fellow is moving around quite quickly. He doesn't look like he's moving quickly, but he's flicking his head from side to side, watching what's going on. And there was one moment where I got him in profile like this and uh, it came up beautifully. This is one uh, also uh, another, this is the uh, fur seal, that's right. You can tell by the, the ears. Um, again, this is me lying down on the ground, getting down to seal level and doing the same sort of shot as I showed you earlier with the penguin head on. And it gives this lovely sort of globular shape and he's looking straight at me and it's just more, more interesting graphically. Now get down, stand up, stand up high, different viewpoints make a huge difference to photographs and particularly eye level. So eye level for people, eye level for animals. Um, when I've been in uh, markets around the world and someone's sitting on the ground selling something, you're going to get a better picture if you can squat down too and get on eye level with them. Otherwise, you're looking down on them. In this particular case, it was the perspective of the head-on shot that, needed to, that I needed to be at the ground level for. It really makes the picture work better. Oh, no got a few too many of these pictures in here but you get the idea head on lying on the ground I mean literally chin on the ground getting down to penguin level gives a, a much much stronger image in my opinion this is another shot looking straight into the sun and again including the ship in the background um, South Georgia St Andrews Bay I think can't exactly remember but the point here is that I'm shooting straight into the reflection of the sun on the water. Uh, super, super contrasty. I mean, to look at this shot uh, was almost blinding because of that water, that the light kicking off the water. Because remember, the sun doesn't get very high uh, in the southern latitudes, and we were there in March, so it's not um, high summer, but it's heading into, well, autumn, I suppose, and the sun's a little bit lower. So this is blindingly bright. I think from memory, the shutter speed of this might have been a 16,000th of a second, um, so bright. But look at the shadow detail and look at the detail in the water. That's astonishing. This, this is what good glass will give you. You haven't got flare. Those penguins are etched out against that bright background. There's no flare wrapping around them. And there's even detail in the fur. This is the sort of thing. This is, this is where the, you know, the, the rubber hits the road, as they say, with high quality equipment. And this is why I've invested in the like of equipment you know, uh, for this sort of shot, is that it, it just lifts the shot above the ordinary. But again, do not be afraid to shoot into the light. It will often give you a much more graphically interesting and certainly more emotional shot. It's more or more dramatic shot is probably a better way to put it. Now, 
there's a slightly different vibe to this picture tonally. It's just a little bit more smooth. Um, you may pick what I've done here. Um, I asked the question when I was doing this talk live and uh, nobody actually got it. But um, this is the sort of hero picture that I'm looking for. It's close enough to the penguins that I can see them clearly, but it's not so close that I could be accused of going too close. Um, they are four and a half meters away, five meters away, but I want to be very careful about that for because people will, you know, will see these pictures and they may say, hey, you're way too close. But more to the point, I'm looking into the light again, but this is a multiple exposure. Um, I do a lot of exposure bracketing, um, particularly with the SL and the SL2. Um, and even with moving subjects like this, because if you're shooting with the SL2, it'll fire off the three shots, the over, the under, and the normal exposure very, very quickly. And not much has moved between them. Uh, you do need to do a little bit of work sometimes, but it's not really much. Lightroom can handle this beautifully, but it gives you the ability to control a very, very high contrast subject very, very easily. And it gives me that little, just gives me some wriggle room with very, very high contrast subjects. If I shoot as a single image, you'll find that either the clouds are white with no detail or that the penguins are more of a silhouette. And yes, you can certainly pull out shadow detail with really good digital files, but it's never quite as good as when you've got a correct exposure for that part of the picture. So I'm simply shooting three different pictures, one correct for the sky, one correct for the shadows, and then a middle one to join them together. And Lightroom will do uh, an auto bracket uh, sort of meld or, or blend quite easily. And it, this is something I will do a uh, video about in the near future, just explaining exactly how this works. And I might even use this picture to, just to, do, um, to uh, show you how it actually happens. I'm also looking for the slightly more arty pictures. So far, we've been talking fairly pragmatically about um, useful pictures and so on. But this one is one that I saw in a blink of an eye as I was trying to get a nice profile picture of one of these penguins. Suddenly, there was a shape, a series of overlapping curves, and I just shot and hoped for the best and, and managed to pull off a sharp image. There's something in this image which has a slightly more sinuous appeal to me. And again, this is something I probably would hang on my wall. Um, I'm quite attached to this shot. It's just the way the, the, the neck of the penguin just arches up and matches the back of this one here. You've got a curve here. You've got not so much of a curve here, but there's still a line and you've got a curve here. Um, it just all fits together in my mind quite nicely. So this is probably more of a lucky picture. It wasn't one that I was looking for. But again, you have to recognize these opportunities when they arise. And suddenly, there's the shot. Shoot it. Get that fo focus right. That's where mastery of the camera comes in so importantly. From the beautiful to the not so beautiful, this is a juvenile male elephant seal with red eye and everything. You really don't want to go near to these guys. These are juveniles. They probably still weigh a couple of tons. Uh, they are a bit grumpy. They can be a little bit aggressive. Um, really a nice idea to stay well away. So I'm probably 10 meters away with my 90 to 280 millimeter lens. And astonishingly, and I don't know how well this will show up on your streams because it is um, obviously a reduced resolution image being a, a video. But this was shot at about 6,400 ISO in the very early morning. Uh, I went ashore at, the first, at first light and uh, had this opportunity and there really was no light to work with. So I just shot to see what happened and I was quite amazed at how much detail there was. And this is actually on the CL. Um, you know, people say APS-C sensors are compromised slightly in terms of high ISO ability, but really, if you can, you know, give it a chance, work with it, don't be afraid of high ISO. And it's astonishing what you can come up with sometimes. I also just love the, the, the way that they're, they're molting these guys. So that's why they look all shabby. And they just lie on the beach and molt until it's time to go back to sea to feed, but they're just astonishing. And their um, sense of personal space is somewhat lacking. This, the one in the background here, whoops, my bad. That one here, he was lying next to this guy. And then he decided he wanted to climb over the back of everybody else. And they do that by just lolloping along. They don't actually walk, they just bounce. 
up and down. So this guy in the foreground was just getting progressively squashed and flattened. And eventually he reared up and bared his teeth and there was a little bit of argy-bargy and they all settled back down again to sleep. But it was, a, it was that slightly sort of sanguine expression on his face that made me shoot the picture. Quite amusing. Now we get to the sorts of shots that they really wanted me to shoot. This is the whole story in one picture. This is the critters, in this case, the king penguins. This is the, the guests coming to see the king penguins from the ship in really good light. And when this sort of thing happens, you need to be on top of your game to get the shot. You can't, it, it, it's not gonna happen again. It's bang, 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 shoot, 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 and make it work. I've got a lot of variations of this. Um, that beautiful low light, there's mist on the water over, over here and over here, the lights coming through, the ship's at a reasonable angle, not perfect, but then, you know, I'm not fussy, you know, you know me. Um, the guests are coming to see, we've got no guests, we've got no um, penguins around the Zodiac, so no one can just, accuse us of being, you know, a little bit gung-ho with everything. Um, it's all happening. And th this is a shot I know that uh, Ponant will be very, very happy with. Um, they've already seen the pictures. They've already said they were happy. So I know that's true. But uh, in fact, one of them, uh, one of the people from the office in Sydney, I know is listening. Charles, hello. Now, don't forget uh, details. Um, this is obviously a king penguin again. This is with the same 90 to 280. There's a, there's a theme there. And this is me just getting really close because they, they sometimes come close to you. Now, the five meter rule is, are you approaching them? But if you're sitting down and the penguins come up to you, that's fair game. You're supposed to retreat, but sometimes if you're sitting, you might just take a moment or two and go a picture. So I was able to get right in on the chest feathers. And this again is a sort of picture that could be used uh, from in a brochure, but I think it also stands on its own merit as, a, as an interesting image. Now, first, the previous picture was a detailed picture. I would call this a detailed picture too, but it's a very, very different image. Um, this is taken in St. Andrew's Bay of a penguin colony. Apparently, it's the biggest one in the world. Um, it has, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, somewhere around 200,000 pairs so the 200,000 or 600,000, but it was a lot of hundreds of thousands of pairs of penguins. And they all roost in this one spot, which obviously is a really good spot if you're a penguin. If you look closely, you'll see there's lots of brown penguins in there too. Those are the juveniles that are almost fully grown and they'll be molting very, very soon. Um, just an astonishing view, really is. This is, still, this is also taken on the 90 to 280. Uh, on the CL because I wanted to get right in and compress that perspective, which gives a, an impression of density. I think the next shot is, yes, this, this is the view of about half of the colony. Uh, I did a panoramic shot as well. It doesn't fit on the screen very well, but I think you'll get the idea. Um, a, an amazing view. The noise and the smell were astonishing. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of penguins doing what penguins do and the smell out of that was wafting across us. But boy, uh, it was so amazing. But you actually walk to a viewpoint and you actually walk to, in a way that you can't see the penguin colony until the last few meters and you come up a slope to a rise. And as you come over the rise, bang, you see this incredible vista. It was just amazing. Different view of the same place, looking along the beach, using the telephoto lens to flatten the perspective. Um, gives you the sense of uh, depth. But you've got to wait for one penguin to stand out here because th this guy here makes the picture as far as I'm concerned. These guys are all looking down or preening themselves or they're overlapping other penguins. You've got one in profile. That's all you need. That's my little gesture in this shot to make it successful. Now there's a, again, I would normally ask, I would normally ask the question, what's wrong with this picture? Um, the answer is this lady here has been duplicated. How on earth is she in two pictures at the same time? That's because this is a multi-image panorama. I do a lot of shots shooting with the camera vertically and going from left to right and then stitching them together. Uh, I may have uh, not quite a wide enough lens on the camera at the time, or I want to get a 180 degree view. I do that a lot, left to right, overlapping pictures. But when people are moving around, you will sometimes get these anomalies. So this is not a picture I would submit to my client, um, I would, or I would repair it. But I just put this in here just to show you what can happen when uh, you're trying to photograph panoramas when people are moving. Now, 
similar shot, but a subtle, a subtle difference is there's nothing to stop you doing panoramas vertically. This is a stitch from down to up using the same techniques with overlap. And that's giving me a not quite 180 degree view vertically, but a much wider angle view than I could normally get. And I really wanted to include this astonishing sky as much as possible. And more to the point, I needed to leave space for a designer to work with. Um, one of the things that you will always be popular um, for is if you're working with designers and publishers is, is giving them op um, alternatives, images which aren't so tightly focused and cropped that they've got nowhere to go with it. Uh, I need to uh, provide versatile pictures. So that this is me thinking commercially again. This is Groot Beacon on South Georgia, the, I suppose one could call it the capital. Um, it's an old whaling station and all of the old machinery is still there. And this is not necessarily a picture which I think would end up in the brochures, but it's a picture that appeals to me. And uh, this is where the angle of the light is very important. You need to pick the side of the uh, big, this is a big, like a big um, vertical cylinder that would be full of I suppose whale oil, it's quite horrible when you think about it, but it's that raking light that picks out the rivets. Um, the front of it would be flat, the back of it would be flat in terms of light, but the size where the light's raking across gives it that, that texture. Things like this, I'll often pick out little details. Um, this is probably more of a personal pick than anything else, just unlikely things, just interesting shapes, not necessarily of a particular place, but to me it's just an interesting texture and an interesting color. Same with these, these are the old scales on the side so that you knew how full the tank was. Um, just makes an interesting abstract. So I'm always looking for things like that. Details again on the ground, there's a, a clump of moss. Uh, it's it's a surprising how much uh, natural history there is to be seen in these bleak places. The whole place is covered in these little mossy clumps and this was just a particularly good one. This is shot on the Leica Q2. I did take one with me to shoot some images, in fact, uh, I did forget to mention that those panoramas I took on the front deck there were also shot on the Q2. Uh, it was the camera I had with me at the time, so I'm going to use it. 47 megapixels again. Uh, these are the last couple of pictures before we go to take you some questions. Uh, I put this one in just to show how to depict scale, because scale is very difficult. That glacier in the distance, you've got no idea from what you see now, how far away and how big it is. Now there's a couple of cormorants on the rock on the left hand side. This was an earlier picture that I shot using those birds to give it some sort of scale, but you don't know how big the birds are. You also don't know how far away the glacier is, so it doesn't really work. So I don't consider this, this a successful image. The next picture, that's more like it. Can you see the zodiac? Now we are very familiar with how big human figures are. I mean, we've seen them our entire lives. So you immediately nail the scale of the shot. And can you see how much bigger the glacier looks between this shot and this shot? It's really looming, it looks much more powerful. So um, that if you can include a human figure at a distance, either Obviously, or even not so obviously, so sometimes it's nice to find the human figure and get that sense of discovery. But this, to me, uh, gives it the sense of scale. And also the lines in the shot are leading you to the zodiac, there and there. So from a compositional point of view, it works quite well. And it certainly gives the scale I was trying to depict. I think that is the last question. So, um, Thank you all for, uh, for listening. And um, I'd like to ask uh, our managing director, Ryan Williams, if he'd like to unmute his mic for a moment. Ryan, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello, welcome. So I hope everybody heard that okay. Were there any questions that, you, um, that were a common theme or of interest that you think we should be answering? Uh, the first one that we did get uh, a few times was, will this webinar be available for viewing later on? Absolutely, it will. They, I'm hoping it is. I, I can see a little recording light going on on my screen to my right here. Um, I'm just going to come back to me. There we go. So yes, they are recorded. I will be posting all of our webinars for um, subsequent viewing on our website. Yes. Excellent. Very good. Um, I'll go to the Q&A section mm -hmm. and read through a few of those. Now, I've tried to 
uh, take notes of what image they were referring to. I may have missed one or two. So um, if we do, we can probably get that person to jump yeah. back in and uh, clarify. But um, we'll start with Ralph's um, question. What ISO did you, do you use in low light? And do you, use, uh, do you set aperture as the priority over speed? Okay, that's a good question. So my preference is aperture priority. Uh, for almost all my images. I just don't see any point in having to choose the shutter speed to match my little needle at the bottom of the screen when the camera will do it for me. So for me, the priority is aperture priority and exposure compensation and checking the histogram or the flashing highlights if you've got your highlight warning set. That makes it extremely quick to nail a perfect exposure. And the ISO I use... <sighs> whatever ISO I need to use to get a sharp image, because the sharp image is more important than a noisy image. So I can work with a noisy image, but I can't work with an image that has camera shake. So you need to do whatever you need to do to make sure you're capturing a sharp image. Uh, I'll happily use 3200 on the, uh, the SL2, the Q2, the CL, um, 64 if I have to. Uh, I use as low as I can, but I always prioritize getting a high enough shutter speed to get a sharp image all the time. I hope that answers the question. Excellent. All right, we'll move on to, I've got a question from Yujia. Um, the lighting in nature is constantly changing. Um, how do you expose correctly for this? And at the I same think, time, think about how to frame correctly. Yeah, well, that comes by with practice, I would say. I know that's not a helpful answer, but it really does. And this is what I, I think I said a couple of times, mastery of the camera is crucial because those are the sorts of decisions that you can make uh, subconsciously or just by sheer you know, familiarity. And that exposure compensation combined with uh, flashing highlight warning in the viewfinder. This is where electronic viewfinders are so good because you can set the SL, SL2, CL to set to have overexposed highlights flashing in the screen and all you've got to do is just dial back the exposure comp a little bit darker until those highlights have gone and you know that your exposure is optimal um, and you can do that in the blink of an eye and it, that that's the key is getting it done quickly and again you can practice this at home practice getting correct exposures practice getting sharp images regardless of what you're photographing that's irrelevant at this point just practice that method Excellent. All right. Um, Charles has asked the question, uh, are you using polarizing filters uh, when shooting water? I get asked this question quite a lot, actually. It's, uh, it's interesting. I used to use polarizers quite a bit when I was shooting film, but this is a long time ago now. I'm not going to tell you how many years. Um, I very rarely use a polarizing filter. Um, there were situations, there's a shot I, uh, earlier in the piece with the, um, the blue of the, in fact, I can go back to it very, very quickly. Let me just was through there was the blue of the water oops no i've lost it um the blue of the water in the foreground that might have been a spot to use a polarizing filter because it removes the reflections on the surface i never use a polarizing filter for blue skies uh, i would always adjust the blue in post in lightroom just to give it a bit more contrast um, i find that more consistent and more controllable and also remember with a polarizer you lose two stops of light so your shutter speed is going to drop too, which is, could be a problem. So it's something I use very rarely. Um, so the, the, the quick answer to that question is no, I didn't use a polarizing filter. And that's why. Okay. Very good. Now, Ashley's asked the question. I'll, I'll read it. It's a little bit of a longer one. Hey, Hi, Nick. Interested in what the actual brief was for the commercial job. Do you get free reign or do you ask for specific shots that are required? I prefer the client, to give, sorry, it, it goes a little bit more. I prefer the client to give specific images they require or because you've been doing this for so long now, uh, do you dictate? Yes. <laughs> um, it, it's actually a little bit of a mixture. Um, there's an element of do what you do because we like what you do, but there's also an element of uh, we'd like you to look for these particular pictures if you can. Um, I know Charles from, uh, from Ponant is, uh, is, is signed on today. And uh, he, he did send me a brief. Um, they're, not, they're not necessarily a shot list of precisely this, that, or the other. They're more of a look out for this and can you get something that connects this to that and, and so on. So it's a little bit of a, t of a, of a both situation. Um, I have done similar jobs where they've gone just shoot it as you see it. 
um, and I've done jobs where it's been highly uh, controlled and I'm not that keen on those sorts of jobs because I want to bring my own style to these things. But luckily for this sort of commercial documentary work, I'm being hired because I'm shooting those sorts of pictures anyway and it, it works. So they're giving me guidelines, I would say, actually, not so much stipulations. Um, but again, case by case basis, um, I'm, I would consider myself hugely fortunate that people will hire me based on this idea of do what you do because we think that's going to work for us as opposed to an uh, actual shopping list of specific things. So that's, and again, that comes with um, time, you know, in the business, I suppose. Okay. And now Nikki's asked, were you using any exposure, exposure compensation? Uh, I actually missed the picture that this was on. So uh, it's on all do you of use them it in general? Level. Yeah, yeah, it's on most of them. Though Every single picture you've seen there will have been me. Exposure compensation. Hang on. Here's a camera. It's on, on the SL2. It's, uh, I've got it set to the top dial. I hope you can see that there. So I'm an aperture priority. I'll choose... A, a, an appropriate aperture that's a conversation for another time maybe and then in the viewfinder i'm checking to see if my highlights are flashing or my histogram is looking a bit too far to the right and then i will be just lightly dialing in a third two thirds whatever i need to i don't really care how much it doesn't matter it's just dialing it darker until those flashing highlights have gone and then i know that my highlights are as bright as they can possibly be but not too bright. And that therefore is an optimum exposure. It doesn't mean the overall picture is where it's going to end up, but it means I've got a technically optimum exposure. And that's my, that's my aim at the time of shooting. Maybe I'll add a bit of mood by dark in the picture later, but I want to get an optimum shot at the time. So hopefully that answers your question. Good. Okay. Um, and Eric uh, asked a question just asking which lens and that was for the picture of the ship uh, where you have the seal sitting out in front of it on the on the ice. Oh okay I don't have that with me but that was taken on the CL with the 11 to 23 so super wide uh, because we did get quite close um, yeah I haven't got that handy it's in the other room but um, I don't have the 16 to 35 for the SL2 otherwise I would have used that but the 11 to 23 on the CL gives you the, exactly the same uh, different angle of view. It's the same, you know, focal length range equivalent. And uh, it's obviously a lot smaller because we're working in Zodiacs and I don't really have a lot of room to maneuver. So sometimes the little CL there was just an absolute winner. Oh, here we go. Here's <laughs> somebody just opened the door and came into the room and gave me the lens. So there we go. That's the lens that I use for that shot. There we go. Eric. If that was Eric Hansen, I'm pretty sure you've got one of these. There we go. <laughs> it may have been. <laughs> okay, so Nimrod's asked a question. Can you tell us how you're able to capture such blue icebergs? Uh, he's referring to the photo with the crab eating seal. Okay, that's because they're really blue. There's no trickery there. It's the sort of thing where you, you, you have to be there and or take my word for it. Because we, we, were, we were talking amongst ourselves going, oh my God, that just can't be. And they are that blue. So those sorts of colors that you see are not exaggerated in post. Those are pretty much as you see them. In fact, there's a few shots where I actually had to dial it back a little bit because the blue, I just knew nobody would believe. And they'd go, eh, you know, he's been cranking up the saturation. No, it's not. They're just absolutely nuts blue. Okay, Ashley's asked a question. Uh, did you just use one body and change lenses or have a wide on one body uh, and then another body yeah. with the uh, 90 to 280? Well, I had the SL with the 24 to 90. This is the 50 mil Summicron, but the, I've got the 24 to 90 just sitting there. That was my go-to lens on the SL2. And then I had the CL as my, my B camera. I had, actually had two CLs. Um, Janelle was using one and I had my other one. And most of the time, I was using it on the 90 to 280 because I wanted the extra reach. Um, I think what Ashley is getting at is, is possibly there is a danger in changing lenses when the conditions are difficult. Now, luckily we had good weather, but I would much prefer to work with two bodies that I could just put one down, pick one up because changing lenses, you really don't want to be putting them down um, because I mean, this is expensive stuff. You don't want to be bouncing around in the bottom of a Zodiac. You really don't. So having two bodies, 
cannot tell you just how much more useful that is than just having the one. Um, I can't afford two SL2s, you know, <laughs> uh, but I've got a, a CL as well. And, and in many respects, it gives me um, a, 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 an alternative to the SL2 because it's smaller and more compact and the quality is, okay, it's 24 megapixels, not 47. But um, if you put that aside, the quality of the image within those parameters is, is so similar. Um, and I'm very happy to use both of those. Absolutely. So two bodies, definitely. Okay. Now, Andrew's asked regarding the abstract um, iceberg photos, how much mm -hmm. adjustment was made to those? I assume he probably means uh, post-production. Yeah, virtually none. Like I said, uh, the blue in those pictures is pretty much as is. It was what attracted me to the shot in the first place. You, you just sort of look and you go, whoa, just how blue is that? And then you shoot it and you get the picture back on the computer screen and you, and you, you think that's just too much. So I think I might have even dial the blue back in that shot a little bit. I'll just see if I can, um, if I just run that PowerPoint thing again, I might be able to go back. Just bear with me a second. Oops, ah, dear, oh dear, press the wrong key. This is all a bit new, there we go. There we go, I'm just gonna whiz back through them off screen and I'll put it on the screen in two secs. There's this one, presentation, cut. There we go, there we go, there's that one and there's Nope. And this one, that one. Yeah. If that's the one you're referring to that, that is, that is as far as I can put my hand on my heart and, and, you know, with all other comparisons off, that's a pretty much as I remember it intensely blue, but it might've even been more blue than that. It's a really hard one to judge, but uh, yeah, very, I, I don't do a great deal of post-production. Um, I'm trying to sweeten the image for publication and viewing in videos or online. Um, I'm not a big, post-production person. I use Photoshop probably once a year. Uh, all of my work is done in Lightroom uh, and I very rarely spend more than 30 seconds on a picture, I, I'm seriously. So you can pretty much trust what you see as what I saw at the time. Okay. And How are we doing the questions? We're, uh, uh, we've got we're five minutes and then we might just- uh, Quite a few, down. I might try and pick through a couple of uh, ones that stand out. So with your, uh, Tony's asked, with your isolated subject examples, I think these were some of the close-up shots of seals. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It's um, with the 90 to 280, um, are you also cropping afterwards or are you trying to frame them perfectly in camera? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, I try to get it right first time, but I'm not obsessive about it. Um, there's a practical limit to what you can and cannot do. I mean, sometimes uh, you just can't get close enough, even with the uh, 280 lens, uh, well, using the long end of the 90 to 280 on the CL, and even then you're too far away. Unfortunately, it's a sharp enough lens that it, keeps, it maintains its crispness and you can crop a bit, which basically gives you the equivalent of a longer lens. But my preference is to frame it how I want it at the time. And that's why I didn't take any fixed lenses with me. Uh, no, I don't think I took any at all. I took the 11 to 23 the, on the CL, the, the 18 to 56 on the CL, the 55 to 135 on the CL, that's the full set of three for that, the 24 to 90 on the SL2 and the 90 to 280 on the SL2. And that was my entire kit. I, I knew that working in the uh, difficult conditions the, the, the luxury or the indulgence, if you like, of the really beautiful Summicrons just was going to be um, something I couldn't afford. Um, it, I, was, I was after functionality rather than look. And to me, the, the, the zoom lenses are functional and look, and the Summicrons are not quite as functional because it's a fixed lens, but has a particular look. So you, you choose one or the other depending on the job in hand. Okay, well, with that, I might jump to a question uh, about gear as well. Melvin's asked, um, could you give us an idea of the size and weight of all the gear you bring with you? And how do you balance mobility against having the right equipment at the right yeah, moment? Yeah, well, this is a very good question. Um, I mean, the, the, let me just lean off screen a little bit here. I'm just gonna, the CL with the 11 to 23. This is, super compact really is this this weighs i don't know what does it weigh ryan about half a kilo 500 grams something like that um brilliant brilliant little camera 
uh, not at all compromised in terms of performance. So autofocus is really quick, optically astonishing, 24 megapixels, not waterproof, uh, not built like a tank like the SL2, okay, and not expensive. So brilliant, small. Then you've got the SL2, which is considerably chunkier. Um, and of course, there's the big 890 to 280, which is, it's, it, it's not, whoops, there we go. It's not a small lens, okay? It's not the biggest lens I've ever used. I've used much bigger lenses than this over the years, um, but still. So the total weight of my gear, to answer the question, is basically a CL with three zooms, three zooms, sending four pictures, uh, and the SL with two zooms. Now, I've got a, um, a waterproof backpack, one of those roll top uh, overboard backpacks, I don't have a camera bag uh, in, 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 for this particular job because you can't be working out of a backpack. With, it's just not possible. So I wrap the cameras in towels and they get stuck in the waterproof backpack so I can very quickly roll the top and be, uh, be impervious to the conditions. So you've got to think about protecting the gear as much as anything else. But at the same time, you've got to be working and get at the, at the gear. And this is a continual paradox that you have to deal with. Um, you know, ideally, you just have them around your neck. But... Mm, it's just a bit too dodgy. So you, you have to judge these things on their merits, but uh, total weight of my gear, probably about four or five kilos, no more than that. So not a great deal. I don't carry a lot of stuff these days. And do you carry, someone asked, did you, do you carry a tripod with you? Uh, I have one around me usually. Like I will often take one ashore and then leave it um, somewhere in case I need it. Um, I've found over the years that if you don't take it, you're going to come across a shot where you wish you'd got it. But if you do take it, you probably won't use it. It's a bit like taking an umbrella out when it's maybe going to rain or not. So I would rather be prepared. Uh, I've got a, a two series Gitzo, um, which is neither light nor heavy. It's right in the middle. It maybe weighs a kilo and a half. And that's stable enough for what I need if I'm careful. But it's not so heavy that it becomes a pain in the neck. Um, so, yeah, again, depends on the job. I mean, sometimes you've got to use a tripod and other times it will be the worst thing possible because you need to be too mobile. Okay. Now, Leanne's asked um, regarding the image of the whaling station, mm. uh, what lens did you use for that one? That was the 24 to 90. It's the most versatile lens of all of them. I mean, I, I honestly think I could do 90% of a shoot with that one lens. Um, it's just uh, so useful. 24 mil is, is pretty wide. Um, it's not ultimately wide, but it's easily wide enough to be dramatic. And 90 is nice and just long enough to do good portraits, plus everything in between. So uh, a lot of those shots, I, I couldn't tell you exactly the proportion, but I would say half of the pictures that I've been showing you were taken on that 24 to 90. Okay. Maybe a third, because there's a lot of pictures on the long lens too, but that's unusual for me. I'm, I very rarely use that long lens. This, this was a particular opportunity to use it, but most of my work around Australia, I don't, I don't need that lens. Okay. Now, Susan's got a question about, and if you can find the picture so everyone mm -hmm. can see it, it's the picture of the, uh, the uh, where is it? Uh, the image looking into the sun before the penguin iceberg, bright sea water. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me just, uh, I'm just going to come back to that one. That must have been South Georgia. Yeah. Just finding it. It'll be towards the end of the okay. And I think it's that image. Um, so, what was the question? Yeah. So judges often pick up on this as a distraction. Um, what is your view? Um, the distraction being? I uh, doesn't say, I'll read it, read it in full. So image looking into the sun before the penguin iceberg, bright seawater, judges often pick up on this as a distraction. Mm, I'm not quite sure why a judge would pick up. I, I, I'm assuming this is the Actually, right Maybe it's the, sure. it mentions the penguin iceberg. Maybe it's okay. the other one. Uh, Maybe this isn't the right picture. Maybe she could hop on chat and if she's still listening and tell us which picture she, we were talking about. Um, wouldn't be that one. It must have been not maybe this one. I'm not sure. Okay. He's on chat. Maybe, maybe, maybe ask the question again. Jump on, I'll, uh, I'll see if I yeah, can come back to that one. Maybe come back to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, she also asked how many of these photos were primarily commercial. Uh, sorry, my chat just jumped. One sec. I'll see if I can find that again. Uh, won't be a moment. Uh, 
No, sorry, it's uh, I've lost that now. When another question comes in, everything jumps. So. Yes, I know. It's, there's a lot of questions here, guys. I'm sorry we can't answer them all. But, That's right. Uh, I'm trying, uh, to, trying to get to most of them if we can. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, we'll go with Michael's question. Overall question, did you find the lack of a longer full-frame telephoto lens for use with the SL2 limiting versus using the crop sensor CL with lower resolution and crop well, image? The, the, the 90 to 280 is a full frame telephoto. So this is actually designed to be used on the SL2. So I was using it on the CL because it's the same lens mount and the APS-C sensor uh, obviously gives me that little bit of extra um, reach uh, in, in, in uh, sort of realistic terms. So this is the full frame telephoto. Now I don't have a bigger lens, if that's what you mean. Um, I have in the past used three, four, 600 millimeter lenses, but Leica don't make such a lens at the moment. Uh, maybe down the track, I don't know, that'd be nice. But um, I didn't, you know what, I didn't miss it at all. What, what I found is that you tend to work, well, you tend to look for the shots you can take rather than worry about the shots that you can't. You know, I'm not a hardcore wildlife photographer. If I did, I'd have a 600 mil lens with me all the time. So I'm shooting more broadly, more, more of a generalist than that. So to answer the question, no, I didn't miss it, but I, it would have been nice to have one because I'm sure there were pictures I could have got that I didn't get, but I got lots of other pictures, which I uh, found quite successful. So, you know, you can't have everything. Okay. I did find that question from Susan. Uh, how many of these photos were primarily commercial and how many did we see that were not commercial and that we, for your personal collection? Um, I'd say on some level, they're all commercial because I'm hoping that, uh, and, and I know this for a fact that the, 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 the cruise ship company, you know, Ponant, they, they do like to use the slightly more arty pictures occasionally in background, just as a graphical element. So the pictures that I shoot for me, um, the color ones would have some use. The black and white ones, not so much. Um, you've, I mean, when's the last time you saw a black and white image in a brochure uh, of some description? Very rarely. But the pictures that I've enjoyed the most uh, would be the black and white ones. And I didn't show very many of those because, um, well, I mean, they're all converted from black and white, any, uh, from color anyway. But uh, for me, I would have black and white images on my wall. Um, my wife would be, she'll be, will be, um, uh, uh, shaking her head and saying, no, 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 we're, we're commercial photographers. We don't do arty stuff, but, uh, but uh, you know, I can have my fun, I suppose. So yeah, I think I'd probably 70, 80% of what I've just showed you would be the pictures that were relevant for the commercial job. Okay. A few people asking whether you prefer auto or manual focus and, and one person asked in particular, um, are you using manual or auto focus when you're uh, auto -focus. photographing the penguins? Auto focus all the time. Very rarely will I use manual focus and probably only when I'm on a tripod. Um, the accuracy of the auto focus when you've worked out its idiosyncrasies and all autofocus systems have preferences, shall we say, like if you point an autofocus system at a blank wall with no texture, it can't focus or the sky, it's got no, because it needs contrast. Okay. By using like the SL2, for instance, has this beautiful mechanism where you can move the focus point around with a joystick and then click it to focus. This is astonishingly elegant and very very functional so when i'm framing a picture i can just guide that focus point and nail it and as long as that particular point has got some contrast it'll it'll get it 99 times out of 100 that being said there are situations where the other folks get confused but by practice you'll learn to anticipate that and when the other focus does get confused you can uh, override it quickly um, so the simple answer to that question is all the time for autofocus, but you've got to be able to rely on it and you've got to know when it might struggle. Um, yeah, that, that's all the time, basically. Okay. Now, Peter's asked, Nick, when shooting low, do you sometimes look for something, a rock, another bird or an animal <clears throat> to block a part of the frame? Um, it depends, I suppose, on what the shot needed at the time. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in keeping things simple. I'm not very keen on the shots that look obviously contrived, looking past something that's out of focus, if that's what you mean. I, I like to keep my pictures to strong and simple. I, I find that um, the uses of those pictures, um, that, that technique lends itself to that uh, more strongly. Um, you can get a little bit carried away with obscuring things. So probably not, not, not my way of thinking anyway. Okay. Uh, Ludwig's asked, uh, what are your preferred function settings on the SL2? 
That will be the subject of a video. I'm going to go through the camera settings uh, with a close-up camera, and I'm going to go through all the settings I use. So uh, let's do that another time, would we? Okay, I'm just catching up with the questions now. Um, what settings do you adjust in Lightroom and to what extent? I think that might be another video. Another one? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised how little. Okay, so just to answer the question, you know, seriously, but, but, but briefly, um, I don't do a lot in Lightroom. It, it'll be a little bit of clarity, a little bit of vibrance maybe, a little bit of a vignette. A lot of those pictures um, have got a little bit of a vignette. If I just come back to, let me, whoops, I've got to activate that. Sorry, it's a bit fumbling around here. That one probably has a little vignette on it. That one doesn't, that one doesn't, that one doesn't. That one does a little bit. A subtle vignette to hold your eye in the shot. There's none of these are particularly strong. Um, little bit of clarity. Uh, yeah, none of these are that obvious. And this shot would be quite heavily on the contrast as well to really give it some, some oomph. Um, so, uh, and then maybe a minor correction for exposure if I was in too much of a hurry. And it's almost always slightly darker than I've captured. I like to capture the picture as light as possible without overexposing it. So I've got maximum shadow detail and then I will adjust the overall feel later on. Um, that's pretty much it. You, you'd, you'd be surprised really how little work I do in these circumstances. I, I'm not, I'm shooting, we, we shot 6,000 pictures for this, this trip. Um, I've submitted a couple of hundred of those to, uh, to Ponant. Um, there's others I could submit as well. We just sort of, we, we've brought it right down to the essence and all the absolute best ones. There's lots of variations of, and so on. But I can't be spending hours on a picture when I've got two, three, four hundred. Uh, I did a shoot for them in the Kimberley last June. Um, and I think we delivered 500 pictures. And um, I can't be spending, well, even 10 minutes on a picture is too much. So I'm getting it right first time as close as possible. Little bit of a zhuzh, little bit of a polish, deliver them. Nobody's complained yet. Okay, I think we're at our last question now. Right. Um, someone's asked, um, do lower, lower temperatures in Antarctica have any kind of effect on your camera equipment? Okay, the first thing is the temperatures weren't actually that low. <laughs> you tend to think it's going to be like minus 20, but we were there. In fact, you may have seen the news after Christmas. They had the hottest day on record over one of the Antarctic bases. It was 16 degrees centigrade. So it wasn't warm when we were there, but it was around about the zero mark. So piece of cake for a camera. Um, I know, uh, obviously, when you get into the middle of the continent, now that's a different story, uh, minus 30, 40, 50 degrees, and that's different. But I've never worked in those conditions, so I couldn't say. But I do know that the cameras are rated, in fact, Ryan, you might know better than me, but I believe that the, like the SL is rated to like minus 20 or minus 30 or something. Um, really, and it's all uh, weather sealed and so on. That, that is a camera I would trust to work in really difficult conditions. But this particular trip, apart from wet days, when it was windy and the rain was coming down and you just want to keep the camera dry, that's no different to working in Tasmania in the winter or in the Victorian high country in the winter. So really not that extreme. I was lucky. Excellent. Well, I think that's the right. excellent of the question. Well, there's still um, 146 people listening, which is really good. So um, that sounds like everybody's been interested in the, in the, the questions and answers. I'm sorry I can't do it live. Um, we will probably evolve to a position where we can do uh, live q and I've got some ideas, whoops, sorry, um, on how we can um, do some, I, I want to do some interviews with other photographers. I've got one lined up for Friday week. I'll keep it secret who it is for the moment. And I'm going to have like both of us on the screen and we're going to be looking at the questions as they come in and actually doing a live uh, discussion and showing pictures and so on. So slightly different model. This is just the first one. I wanted to start off in a nice, easy to approach way, nothing too technical, um, see how all this technology works. And so far, I think it's worked quite well. Um, so there, we've got lots of ideas. Now, please, if you've got an idea for a topic which you, th you think would make a nice, neat little five minute video or 10 minute video or something, or a webinar topic, email me, preferably, uh, info at lycraacademy.com.au. Uh, if I was really cool with this stuff, I'd just press a button and it would pop up on the screen, but that's, I haven't quite mastered that bit yet. But you should know what the uh, Academy email address is because most people who are taking part have been uh, sent the newsletter. Uh, those of you who have come to us through Facebook, or 
who have not doesn't we, who don't get the newsletter if you go to the academy site and sign up for that we'll be sending it out weekly with what's coming up in the future so really interested in ideas for new content really interested in feedback um and all those sorts of things so yeah email me direct and i'll um i'll, I'll read all of them and we'll come up with a plan all right well ryan's muted himself so i'm going you're still there ryan i think we're going to wind it up there uh is that okay with you ryan i think we've answered all the questions um, yes all good thank all you good. Nick. okay not a problem well look thank you everybody for um you know, watching. Uh, we had a lot more people than I was expecting, which is really good. Um, so we will do another one of these next Friday, same time. Um, the, oh, uh, the, we may do them at different times as well. We're still experimenting a little bit with what's best for people. If you think there's a better time of day or day of week, let us know. Next week, I'm going to do a uh, another presentation. Um, so straight through like I've done today on the essence of landscape So just looking at and it's looking at other photographers work Some of the really big names like Ansel Adams and Art Wolf and people like that and just going through images and saying what works and what you know What why that pitch is successful some of the thought processes so a, a, an overview nothing too technical and after that We'll get down into some more technical discussion. So hopefully there's something for everybody there All right well, thank you, Ryan, for taking part and uh, helping with, with the questions. I think that worked quite well. And I'm going to sign off now. And hopefully I'll talk to you all again uh, in a week's time. So thank you for watching.